welcome to the 30th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I'm your host, Steve Patterson, and I've got an awesome interview for you today. We're talking about Buddhism. Some of the most difficult questions in philosophy have to do with the nature of the self and consciousness and personal identity. These issues are central in Buddhist philosophy. I had a wonderful conversation about these topics with a professor at Harvard while I was in Boston. My guest is Dr. Janet Gyatso, who is the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies at Harvard. She's the author of many books, including Apparitions of the Self, which is the topic that we're talking about today. Before we dive into it, I'm happy to announce that Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, my first book on philosophy, is now available for pre-sale. The book will be officially released on Cyber Monday, that's the 28th of November, but you can reserve a copy today. Go to steve-patterson.com slash books and you'll see the link for it. It's by far the most important thing that I've ever written, and I'm going to be referencing it for the rest of my entire life. So if you're interested in logic and epistemology and foundational questions, and you want a clear answer to the question, can we know anything with certainty, then that's the book for you. I'm also happy to announce that Patterson Pursuit is going to be back on the road starting December 6th. My wife and I officially got tickets to New Zealand, and then we're going to go to Australia. There's a mathematician down in Australia that I can't wait to talk with. So about a month from today, we will be leaving upstate New York and continuing our international journey. So speaking of selves, if you find yourself stuck at a college somewhere and you're not getting the kind of college experience that you like, either the ideas aren't up to snuff or you're not learning any real-world skills, the sponsor for the show is the company Praxis, and they specialize in taking young and enthusiastic people who want to learn about the real world and placing them at a paid apprenticeship for six months. They also give you three months of professional job training, and once you go through their program, they guarantee you at least a $40,000 a year job offer. Right now, Praxis participants are making on average $50,000 a year, and there's a reason why their program is exploding in popularity. So if you're interested, go to discoverpraxis.com, and on their homepage, they have a button that says schedule a call. Click it, set up an appointment, and see if it's right for you. So I hope you guys enjoy my interview with Dr. Janet Gyatso, and this is another interview very high on my list when I get to recording some more interview breakdowns. Enjoy. So first of all, I want to thank you for sitting down and speaking with me today. Sure. No, it's my pleasure. I am perplexed by one phenomenon I keep thinking about, and I don't have a good answer for it, and it's my own consciousness. So <laughs> I like the idea of the physicalist worldview. I think it's very simple. It's very easy to understand. There's nothing remarkable going on. And I can explain a great deal within the physicalist framework, but when I think about myself, when I introspect and I'm aware of my feelings, I have a very difficult time putting that into the physicalist worldview. I say, well, it seems like I am some kind of a being or some kind of a person or my consciousness doesn't seem like it itself is a, some physically existent thing. It doesn't seem like it's a particle or some assortment of matter. And so I was wondering what the Buddhist's conception of the self is and does it could it be fit into the physicalist uh, metaphysics, or does it imply s something bigger than the, the physicalist metaphysics? Well, okay, so there's a lot of, a lot of parts of that question. And um, first of all, just the notion of the self. The self is a very important term in Buddhism, and it's one of the sort of key doctrinal insistence that um, the self is generally a construct that we create and it doesn't have, it doesn't refer to anything that exists independently in the world, but rather it's dependent upon how we construct it and uh, many things go into its construction. And so one of the biggest points in all of Buddhist thought is that we need to be aware of this fact because the ensuing attachment we have to any idea or definition that we have of ourselves as a self gets in the way and leads to a lot of problems. In fact, it's one of our worst problems. And it's this problem then gets uh, connected to 
what is usually often translated as essentialism about any given thing. So it's not only the self, but any given identity of anything, be that in the physical or mental world. So the question of the physical and mental is a, is, is a different question than that of the nature of the self. And certainly definitions of the self can be myself is my body or whatever, and that would be a physical definition. Myself is a kind of uh, personality or a set of propensities. It's a kind of set of emotions mm, and okay. so on and so forth. So the question, the relationship between mind and body, that I'll just say is one of my big interests as well. And I share with you a kind of desire to really privilege physical existence in, and I do think that in some ways everything does boil down to physical existence. Um, but the, the the so there's two things in in kind of classical Buddhist doctrine. The um, there is a clear distinction between body and mind. You know these are terms. You know nama rupa, for example, and. Um, and so lots of uh, th formulations are put in those terms, and so they, they are clearly seeing that these are two domains that are not completely collapsible. However, when you do the kind of work that I do in Buddhist studies, I find many sorts of instances where we really see one being an epiphenomenon of the other. And that's a, you know, I think asking that question in the particular terms we're asking it now, mm -hmm. you know, is we're maybe asking those questions a different way than they did. Um, but, you know, but if we use Buddhist philosophy as a resource to think about these issues, and they thought about them a lot, actually, um, and in many different domains, I think there's a lot more to be said about it, you know. I, th I think it's obviously one of the biggest philosophical questions of all time, mm -hmm. you know. So, so I guess for me, when I think of the self, it has this very intimate connection with the mind, with consciousness, but it's almost one layer deeper that there is, it's not just the phenomena of consciousness, it's my consciousness. It's that I, that I feel like I'm this being with the, who is experiencing these things. It's not just the experience is happening, it's that it's my experience, that mm -hmm. me part. Yeah. So that me part, you're saying that's a construction. Can we, can we dive a little more into that? So what does it mean for something to be a construction? Is it an illusion? Is it something that doesn't actually exist? Is it something, is it a concept that we think actually has some kind of independent existence, but really it doesn't? No, it is a concept. And it, it does exist as an illusion. I mean, this is like one of these difficult things that is... I'm floating in front of my class all the time. I'm teaching my Intro to Buddhism class, and we're talking about all these questions. Uh, but um, the my part of the my consciousness has a lot of different um, meanings and, and in what that my consists and what its status is with respect to consciousness could be quite different. It's not obvious exactly what that means. And Buddhists would say that, yeah, it doesn't, there is no independent ex existence of this entity that would allow the genitive pronoun my to uh, stand on its own other than an idea that we create or a way of explaining things to ourselves. So it's at least conceivable that there could be some type of conscious goings on without that possessive. Absolutely. Various. That's kind of one of the things that they play with. So this, is, that, is that a state of mind that somebody can experience? Is the being yeah. the conscious without the being the being or being yeah. the person? Yeah. Yeah. Now, again, what that means is very, you know, various and complicated, but yes. And, you know, at the minimum, um, even, even if you could say that the minus the, the, the status of the my or the ego or the cogito or whatever um, uh, doesn't uh, dissolve 100%, uh, but to the degree that it's sidelined hmm. and, and reduced is the degree to which we're able to em empathize with others and the degree to which we're aware of reality around ourselves hmm. and the degree to which we're less attached to identity issues 
and can function more ethically, more creatively in the world. So when you said we can't entirely get rid of it 100%. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm saying even if, you know, oh. so whether we can or not mm. is itself a question, you know, whether I believe that or whether that's what Buddhists say or any particular Buddhist school says mm -hmm. that. I, I, Buddhist schools do, uh, you know, come out with statements that you could entirely get rid of it. But then when you look closely at what exactly do they, do they mean by that, it gets complicated. But on the surface, they will say, yes, you can get rid of it. But I was saying that even, even if we don't have to, like, talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me ask you, because this is, when I experience phenomena as I interact with the world, I have developed this explanation for what's going on that I don't know how it can be compatible with um, what you've just presented, which is, it seems like I, there is a point of perspective that I have, or my, my perspective, we can put that in quotation marks. But I also believe that you, or at least what I'm referencing when I use that term, also have a perspective, and it's the same. In the, it's very similar in the sense that you, there is this perspective and that perspective, and they're not ultimately the same perspective. Doesn't that imply some kind of a self, or or at least some kind of a uh, true metaphysical difference between the perspectives? No, not at all. For one thing, um, uh, your perspective is always changing, and my perspective is always changing. First of all, and that's a really important part of this, the, the sort of logical proof that is given about the self is that it's always changing. It doesn't remain the same. And mm. so at the minimum, you have to say that any kind of such conception is, is a shorthand for what, in fact, is always in flux. And so once it's always in flux, uh, going back to Aristotle, um, something that's always in flux undermines its ability to have an essence. The main Buddhist critique is about this notion of essence. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that you have a perspective and that I have a perspective, even if both of them are in flux, the very fact that we're able to communicate shows that there's important ways that our perspectives overlap. And, and there also are extremely important um, ethical capacities to take on the perspective of others, you may not be able, again, you may not be 100%, but mm -hmm. you're, you, we are able to do that, hmm. we try to do that. It's a very important part of what we do, actually, as human beings in a community of so, people. So do you, would you say then the claim could be something like this, that what exists is not a bunch of selves with fundamentally different perspectives, that there's one type of thing that's out there, or one type of consciousness, and it's artificially broken up between? No, 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 no we're not going there either. Okay. So that would be to hypothesize a, a, a one consciousness. Okay. So any, the, 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 the aim, the target that the Buddhists are aiming at is the hypothesization or the essentialization. So be it one big thing or a bunch of little individual ones. The problem with all of it is not to see that every single one of those things is constructed from out of many different parts, and those are constantly shifting, and the way that we name them depends on what particular perspective we're taking at any one particular moment, which itself is always changing. And so there are, there's energy, there's phenomena, things are happening, mm -hmm. but none of them have an essential identity or essential essence. So when you say things are happening, but if they don't have an identity, then they're not really things, right? No, that's the whole point, is that uh, things don't need an identity in order to, to be there. So what are you referencing when you use the term things? I'm always referencing it from whatever particular angle that I'm taking. So, you know, you do need to give things identity in common human communication, mm -hmm. and you do that all the time. But those, again, are products of our conceptions, our set of concepts, our set of constructions, and they don't necessarily belong to the thing as such. So there is no thing, per se? No. Everything's in flux. Everything's constantly changing. But there is and everything, so, but there's not one particular there's thing. There's not in everything either. The, so you're just, then you're just moving to making this one big thing in the sky or something. <laughs> so no, there isn't. The universe is infinite. Um, and um, 
So if, if, if you were to think of the world as, and, or to just take the room that we're in, everything in the room is constantly in flux, it's constantly changing, it's constantly moving. And if we were to see this on a screen, it would be constantly morphing, nothing would be standing still. Mm -hmm. And to say, okay, there's this thing, Steve over here, and there's this Janet, we would have to like cut out a picture mm -hmm. and freeze frame. But that would be itself artificial, mm -hmm. okay? So that's the point. So when, when we say that, it sounds, so when I, when I think this just in common language, it seems like you're saying really nothing exists, in a sense. It's like there's no, there's no, no thing. Well, yeah, so it's the thingness. But it, it depends what you mean by nothing exists. It's not that this is a blank nothingness. It's like, that's one of the problems with language is any word I use to talk about what does exist yeah. is going to run into trouble if you put it under a microscope. So the word thing I was using as a sort of provisional term to try mm -hmm. to get a handle. Mm -hmm. But actually, any such term that when we look at closely, we're, we're going to see that that too is a construction. That still doesn't mean that there's nothing. Okay. So there is something. There's not something. There's something. Yeah, put it that way. Okay. So now, this is the kind of language game you have to get into. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's what the Buddhist texts are always doing. Okay. And they use language that way to try to break down our habits of thinking, to open okay. up new modes of think thinking. So for that something, is it, does it have any constituent parts to it? Yeah. But each of those parts themselves are made up of constituent parts mm -hmm. down to an infinite regress. So there's no base anything? No. Okay. So <laughs> you take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, I have to think about. It. So if it's true that at some level there is something or there are constituent parts, it seems like it would require that ultimately that you don't have an infinite regress, that you can't have something made up of a lot of nothing. Um, because it depends on what you mean by nothing. Mm -hmm. So nothing doesn't mean blank slate or total darkness, blackness. It just means that nothing is hypothesized. Okay, this is an excellent segue then, because a lot of people, especially in the West, when we read Eastern ideas, I think a lot of people take them, I think they interpret them the, the wrong way. They take them very, very literally, and I think it causes all kinds of problems. Like, for example, someone says nothing exists. I think a lot of people take that to mean, oh, literally, Nothing. There's nothing there that is, exists. Exactly, which I don't think is the. I don't think that's what no, the you're Eastern. No, not saying that. So, what appear to be paradoxes? Was it nothing exists? Well, that's not literally true. What is the Buddhist take on paradox or even logical contradiction? Like, are are these things that are meant to get at a deeper premise to get us to to realize our constructions about the world? Or do they accept, look, there are some paradoxes that are actually there and you just kind of have to, you have to deal with it? It's the former. The former. Okay, so for logic specifically, would you say there, in Buddhist thinking there is any acceptance of actual logical contradiction? You can make a logical contradiction, you know, you can make it all the time. It depends what it means and how you're using it. Mm -hmm. So if I say something like, you know, I exist and I don't exist. You can say that, but it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so then, you know, I'm not gonna, we're not going to bother with stuff okay. that makes no sense. You can say that. It, and it, and every, every utterance depends on its rhetorical context and what you're trying to do with it and how you're using it. Okay. And so any one single utterance taken out of context can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And that's an, another major part. It's very similar to what I've already been saying, that our notion of ourself is, depends on what perspective we take on it. And mm -hmm. the same thing... For language, so that you certainly can construct a paradox, but um, what's the status of that paradox? Is it an artificial game or whatever? I mean, the, the, the thing about paradox in certain kinds of Buddhist texts, it, it, it is the former of the two options you gave, that a seeming paradox requires us to maybe move to another level to understand certain assumptions that we're bringing to that paradox. Yes, I think that that makes a great deal of sense. And, and, I, and I can, you know, refer also to the law of the excluded middle, which is like saying, you know, either I exist or I don't exist. I, I've actually worked on this topic a little bit, and um, 
And the law of the excluded middle depends on a faulty presumption that there's a clear um, dividing line between exists and doesn't exist, or yes and no. And it's a bifurcated line, which, yeah, that's a paradox if, if you accept that assumption. But mm -hmm. if you don't accept that assumption, the whole thing falls away. So would you say something like that, specifically on the, the law of the excluded middle, that it presupposes identity, or it, it presupposes yeah. that there are... Boundaries. Exactly. The meaningfulness and absoluteness of boundaries. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. So in my conversations that I've had with a lot of people, especially maybe if they haven't heard this perspective, the idea that in Eastern philosophy you em they embrace actual logical contradiction, this is just this is just an error. It's not not supposed to No, not, not at all. No, right. The you know, they're not idiots, you know. <laughs> um, they they're you know, we'd have to examine a particular case, you know, what right. is this contradiction? Right, right, right. And how is it being used and so on and so forth. But no, not at all do they embrace those contradictions. You know, if anything, they'll say, oh, on one level it, it's yes, and on another level it's no. Mm -hmm. They, and, and, you know, the contradictions are difficult to understand. I was just teaching a very important Buddhist text today in my class two hours ago, which it was really stops the brain and is, and it's, on the surface, appears to be blatantly self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. um, but it isn't. Actually, they're trying to make another point, right. and and they think that the exercise in figuring that out is going to be very beneficial. This is another excellent segue. So, my understanding—correct me if I'm wrong here—my understanding of the Zen cones and it has a similar goal as something like meditation, which is you're it is trying to get people to calm their mental constructing. Yeah. It's trying to quiet that down so that you can just exist and have a more true understanding of what exists by relaxing those boundaries, if you will. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that accurate? Yeah. You know, it's not only relaxing them, but it's also seeing through them and, right. and understanding them. The koan thing's a little different. It's less about calming. Mm -hmm. The koan is a tradition of confrontation between master and disciple in which they're posing a seemingly contradictory paradox where they say something that's very outlandish and 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 it bear and the contradiction or the situation bears reflection mm -hmm. and by virtue of reflection one gets to a state where one is able to either transcend mm -hmm. the seeming contradiction or, or something happens to our habitual thought processes so it's not it's not only a thing of calming, but calming is certainly part of it. When you say they get to a state of transcending, can you unpack that a little bit? What does it mean to transcend? I don't mean transcend in the usual way of like a transcendent philosophy, but right. it's more like um, sometimes a contradiction will be posed in order to get the person to realize that the point of it is to um, uh, expose the inability of, of a certain kind of propositional statement to ever be exactly correct. So the transcending is a transcending between like a particular proposition and to look at the larger phenomenon and that makes the proposition possible, which is the very functioning of language. Mm -hmm. And so it's to draw your attention to the functioning of language rather than assuming that language has an obvious uh, you know, unproblematic referent. Okay, so I have two more questions for you. One on this, on this line, has to do with the term the unity of opposites. I've heard this. I've seen this term come up a lot. Can you explain what in Buddhist thinking is the unity of opposites? That maybe you can't have black without white, or you need some in order for something to appear as a thing, it has to be in contrast to a background or in contrast to a something else. Is mm -hmm. that is that also is the would it be fair to say that the the central idea or one of the central ideas in Buddhism is to reject or to see past that um, boundary that we're saying you know there's the di some objective distinction between this and that. That, that ultimately that is a that's a dualistic bifurcation that a, doesn't actually exist or that it's artificial. Yeah, but I'm worried about the notion of unity. 
Right. I would say the relativity or the interdependence mm -hmm. rather than the unity, and it depends right. on which way they're unified. And is they're by no means seen, you know, you have this common phrase that students all think is what Buddhism means is all is one. And I've never, I've never seen a statement like that in Buddhist texts. And because once again, if there's, there's, first of all, they're not trying to erase difference. There is difference, even though it's always relative. It's not absolute, but it is relative. And they're not posing some one big fat one out there. I think that's a more Hinduistic idea, right? Well, I, yeah, and I'd be careful also using the word Hindu. Well, but right. you can say in the <laughs> Upanishadic literature, which is one early branch of what's now called Hinduism, would be the way to put that. <laughs> You're in the university here. We have to be precise right. with our things. But. OK, so the last question that I want to ask you is going back to the consciousness and also has to do with this seeming distinction between things. That theory that there is a seems to be a unique difference between the contents of my awareness, the contents of my consciousness, the feelings that I'm having and yours. Mm -hmm. Is that a objective distinction of any if I had to theorize of any meaningful objective distinction that isn't relative, that seems to be absolute and mm -hmm. talking about something in the world, that would be right up there probably number one. It's, it seems to be that, you know, even my, my perspective, even from the sense of like, I'm looking at you from this side of the table, you're looking at me from that side of the table. Though the actual awareness, isn't that something that would be non, a non-relative distinction? Well, that's one of the hardest things for anybody to explain is the so-called existence of other minds. Yeah. And um, that was a debate that was taken up at a certain point in Buddhist philosophy and I don't think was satisfactorily dealt with. But um, one thing I would distinguish, first of all, is the uh, nature of awareness as such and the particular contents of it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think that the ways in which the habits of thought and the ways that awareness is constructed between you and I are probably shared in many ways. We're very much constituted by our shared language, our shared historical knowledge, our shared cultural knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, there is a way, nonetheless I agree with you and I think about this too, there is a way in which if I'm thinking of a number right now in my head, mm -hmm. I can do it, and you won't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure because that that's because there's some kind of fundamental difference between my mind and your mind. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a way that the kind of continuum of psychophysical aggregates that you kind of collect around a kind of point over there and the one that I have over here is um, doesn't have access to everything so you don't know everything there's also there's a lot of other things you don't know as well you don't know what's inside my bag mm -hmm. so it's not only a question of one mind and another mind mm -hmm. um, so so it you know the way that we try to understand that particular problem I agree is a really interesting question. I'm not sure that Buddhist thinkers have fully worked that out. I mean, Buddhists do depend on an idea that there's many ways in which one can know the thoughts of others, actually. And I think that it, um, um, that hasn't been explored either. It's one of those fields that, you know, that's out in la-la land, you know, because nobody believes that we really can read other people's minds. I actually think it's a very interesting question because I think it's not like a magical, mysterious thing. It's just we some t by people's bodily positions, by other kinds of um, perceptions, you can tell a lot more about a person than is immediately evident. And mm -hmm. I think that Buddhists were interested in developing those skills. I don't think, however, that it's, you know, at this very abstract level of, you know, I'm just thinking of a number right now. Right. And you don't know what it is. Um, 
Um, I think that would be very Seven. hard. What? <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> it was three. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and then I thought of 243 or something. But uh, that to make it harder for you. But uh, yeah. Um, but um, uh, that's an extreme that they lay out. So there, there's a number of debates about how omniscient is the Buddha or not. And d does the but actually know every single fact in the universe, or is it that he understands the principles behind every single fact? And the guys who are trying to argue that he actually does know every single fact were probably outclassed by the guys who are saying, no, 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 nobody knows everything mm -hmm. like that. So, there, you know, so there's lots of things that we don't know. Okay, so let me ask you, let me, maybe this is a better way of phrasing it. Are there any, is the claim that distinctions between things are relative. Is that a, an absolute claim? Is that saying in, there is no circumstance in which you have a true absolute distinction between things that isn't a construction? Yeah, because whatever the thing is itself can be deconstructed. So would this be a circumstance then with the existence of other minds where it would seem like that, that distinction is not conceptual or constructed. It seems like we're talking about the things separate, in a sense, separate. The distinction is separate from our minds, our, our, our conception of it. Would that be an example of a... I'm not so sure because you're trying to pose them as opposites, and I'm not sure they're opposites. And I think it would be really important, first of all, to think about the question of your mind versus what's in my purse. Mm -hmm. So I think we're mixing two different problems. One of them has to do with the nature of consciousness, mm -hmm. and one of them has to do with the nature of things and absolute difference. Okay, so maybe we can get around this. Maybe we can, I don't, I don't know if this is a way to get around it, but what if I say, okay, forget differences in consciousness. What if I say the contents of my own perception, I'm talking about my visual field. Mm -hmm. There is kind of a tan blob here and there's kind of a blue blob there mm -hmm. in my visual field. Now, they have some constructed relationships. So for example, if this, that blob is over here, that blob is over there, that only makes sense kind of as a together, as they're relative to one another. But the actual feeling or the actual like qualitative experience of these things seems to be different, seems to be meaningfully different that it wouldn't be a construction, right? Haven't we found like a a non-relative distinction mm -hmm. in my own conscious experience? Say the difference between the ex experience of blue and tan, for yeah. example. That's a much faster way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> so they're different, Yeah. but they're on a continuum with each other. Uh, the continuum being? Color. Color. Okay. Thank you very much for You're talking to me. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, that's been fun. All right, that was my interview with Dr. Janet Giazzo. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You'll notice with this interview, we have a fairly abrupt ending. That's just because we had a hard deadline, but I'm hoping to have Dr. Giazzo back on the show because there's so much philosophy to break apart here, and she really knows her stuff. In my own examination of metaphysics, trying to investigate what types of things exist in the world, I found that the central issue, really in all of metaphysics, has to do with boundaries. Where are the objective boundaries in the universe, if any? However you choose to answer that question has gigantic implications on the rest of our worldview. So I've got a lot more to say about the topic. Thanks for listening, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.